Okay, let's bring in the wonderful Wednesday MPs who span the country here. Stella Ambler's in the middle of the country. She's a conservative MP representing Mississauga. Jenny Sins is our NDP MP from North Delta, BC. And Yvonne Jones is our liberal MP hailing from spectacular Labrador. Welcome back, you. You've been away a while. Thank nice you. to have you here. Uh, let's talk about this Chong uh, motion. And I'll get your thoughts first, if I can, Yvonne, on this. Is anything going to change in the result in the Liberal Party of Canada? Well, I think you're going to see change in all the parties because of this. Um, you know, maybe not the, the change that a lot of us would like to see immediately, but I think what it really does is it gives a little little more authority to members of parliament. Uh, it allows us to have more input than we've had in the past in important decisions that make up and comprise our party. And, uh, you know, it, it tells me that obviously uh, within the Conservative Party, there, there had to have been some major issues with regard to um, the hierarchy and how it worked uh, for um, Mr. Chong to come forward with a bill like this. But I think it's, it's a small step towards election reform and one that all parliamentarians are going to be looking to see how it's going to advance in itself over the next, uh, next little while. So if Justin Trudeau blows the election and Harper gets another majority, the first decision could be vote him out of the leader's office. <laughs> Listen, I can't predict. <laughs> what, I just uh, that what they're I going have. to do, Don, but uh, I, I don't see the result coming out that way myself. Oh, I see it a whole, whole lot not. different than that. <laughs> Jenny, what's the NDP take on this? Well, it's a baby step in the right direction. We would have liked to have seen a lot more in this legislation. As for electing our chairs, we in the NDP already have a pretty codified set of rules for how we function as a caucus and all of that. Uh, I would have liked this legislation not to have been watered down as much as it has because it's now really left up to the parties. There's nothing kind of um, to force or to enforce. But for me, I think uh, one of the key things we still have to address if we're really looking for reform is uh, proportional representation in the House and, uh, you know, to have the voices of Canadians being heard. But Don, I do want to take a moment to say the name of my riding because there's one part of the riding well, that Richmond, always forgets. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Surrey Newton, it's a the long North Delta. Title. Yeah, All right. and they always say you. They never mention Newton, and I thought, no, I'm going to say it today. <laughs> this must be an election year. All right. <laughs> Can you ever see a caucus, a conservative caucus, voting to review Stephen Harper's leadership <laughs> ever? Is that even remotely possible? <laughs> well, apparently it's possible now, so you never know. Uh, but I think what, what we need to think about today, I, I mean, we voted just this afternoon, um, is, uh, is the fact that we're now giving Canadians more of a voice through their members of parliament. I think that's part of what this bill does as well. It's not, it's not just a, um, something that, that we as parliamentarians care about. It's something that I've received um, many letters from my constituents about uh, asking me to support this because they understand that democratic reform uh, enables them to have a voice uh, in government and, and in parliament, uh, more importantly. Uh, you know, Don, I've known, uh, uh, Mike and I have been friends for uh, many years since uh, long before we were elected to Parliament, mm -hmm. and so I mean, I can absolutely vouch for his commitment to making a stronger Parliament, and I really I respect him a lot for that. I'm just so delighted that this bill has passed. I'm always glad to have the three of you because uh, uh, women MPs I think have a perspective on some things that I just don't have or men don't have, and and this radicalization of young women, and that they're going over to Syria, leaving Canada, going to Syria. Presumably to uh, marry uh, ISIS warriors and do you know, some spy activity over there for them. I don't get it. Is there anything you think that's in the current legislation before the, the House that could maybe stop that? Is that something that this legislation could actually do? Or do you think there's no way to do it? Ginny. I don't think there is anything in the current legislation that would stop radicalization of youth right here in Canada. However, I think there are steps we can take. First of all, my heart goes out to the mother and the family and other Absolutely. Muslim community members who must just be so scared that this could happen to them. I think that we've got to talk about radicalization of youth in a real way. And I'm so proud of the BC Muslim Association. They have been doing some amazing work 
in BC on addressing radicalization of youth. And I think one of the things the federal government could do, because they've asked the federal government for support, mm -hmm. is to provide them the support to do this. Right now, CBS, RCMP, myself through my office, and um, the local uh, BCMA, uh, we've had a series of workshops uh, in Surrey, in Vancouver, in Burnaby, and in which you know, we've had packed rooms when people come together to talk about these issues and you get parents who've got young children who are born here, these parents were born here, and they're saying this is not the future I want for my children. Mm -hmm. We need help. Stella, what do you see in this bill that might help? To answer your question, uh, uh, absolutely. There are provisions in this bill that, um, you know, would have made possibly things go differently in this in this case um, specifically the bill gives uh, our security agencies the the power to disrupt a threat that they see as imminent so in this case of this young woman um, instead of CSIS going to the family and saying well you know we can't tell you what we know but we kind of suspect your 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 daughter is a terrorist well I'm a mother I would say you know, what would I say to that? I could never believe that would be my child could do that. What this bill does it, is it gives CSIS the power to talk to the family, give them the information, lay it out for them. This is what we found. This is what we know. And after that happens, John, what what mother wouldn't take that child's passport and and rip it up herself to stop her from traveling? Hang on, Jenny. I'll get your chance. Yvonne, does, does Stella have a point here? Well. I, I don't know if it's a real point in terms of how, how far this will go to stop the ra radicalization that we're seeing right mm -hmm. now. I think that government has a role and that role can be greater achieved and defined in working with the communities that are affected. Um, first of all, the Muslim community in Canada I think has a tremendous role to play and they're stepping up to play that role and I'm really happy to see that. I'm proud of what they've been doing. And I think that first of all they can lead the way for a lot of the rest of us in Canada and in how we deal with our communities and how we deal with people who we think might be affected. From a government's perspective, giving CSIS the authority to reach out to families is going to be one small part of it. Families need a way to reach back as well. Mm -hmm. uh, young people that are being impacted need a way to reach back. And I think that's the avenue that we haven't really addressed yet. We haven't really opened that line of transparency Jeez. and dialogue for those Jenny, that need it. Jenny's itching to get in here. Right. You know, I've worked with young people all my life. And I think every parent out there, no matter what problems or situations their children have got into, if they could just say to them, stop, and that child wouldn't do it, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have half the issues we do have. Mm, that's true. So it takes far more than that. It's very simplistic to say that just because CSIS is going to go to your house and tell the parent, <laughs> and you can take a passport away, well, don't you think that if somebody is that radicalized by that time, they're already going to have access in how to get another passport and how to get out of the country and get engaged. For me, I think prevention starts a lot before that. It starts with the very young, starting to educate them about what the religion means. And this is where the Muslim community, I've seen them play this part in my community and I'm so proud of them. And this happens. And I think, you know, I will take it to another example. We know that fires burn. Right? If you put your hand on a fire, it burns. Right. How many children will still touch that fire knowing that or something hot? Well, they only do it once. So. Just trying to <laughs> test it. And that's what I'm saying that we, I absolutely agree, we do need to address radicalization, but it can't be done by government or by CSIS. Right. This has to be done working with the communities that are being Sorry. impacted. Okay. And All instead right. of feeding yeah. this Why fear, let's actually help communities. We can do because we have three votes here. Yes. yes. And we're parliamentarians, so what we should do is vote for the
the legislation that gives our security agencies the powers to do these things and the power to disrupt threats because let's face it the threat is real Canadians understand that they understand that um, that these uh, jihadi terrorists are um, they're affecting um, uh, what's going on around around the world they're recruiting Canadians uh, to send them overseas and there are things that we can do to ensure that that hap oh, yeah. that, that doesn't right. happen um, and that that includes giving them um, uh, this power to disrupt these threats Thank and to, to be yeah. able to what, talk about it. What's for certain is that this is not a partisan issue. It's a Canadian issue. Mm -hmm. And it's one that is affecting all Canadian families. We talk about the Muslim community because, unfortunately, their people are being attacked most. And they're the people that are being dragged into yes. this, whether they want to be or not. And, and that is shameful. But it affects all of us in this country. And I think if there's one thing that we can do for our country today is to put the partisan politics aside. Terrorism is a global issue. It's affecting all of us. We all have a role to play. We may defer on what role that is, but we all have a role to play. And I think as parliamentarians, we have to work together to make sure we serve well the said. people that need us. And that's the last word. Sorry about that. We're out of time. Thank you all. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.